thing is, um, oh, thank you, thank you, Emma. That's the thing I always forget to do. <laughs> the uh, it's always nice because you get on these sessions, you get to know various people. Uh, so we've got some people from the university today, and uh, sometimes we'll have people joining us from all over the world. Um, I'll just do a shout out. Hey, John, how you doing today? Yeah, we're going to get started in a moment. The this is and this is kind of sad, Stacy. We usually in Canada when we start these things as people are are coming in, we always talk about the weather. But this week in Canada, the weather has almost across the country has been brilliantly warm and sunny. So <laughs> we don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> Nothing to moan about. It has been a, a record-breaking heat uh, that we've got plenty to talk about. Hey, we can do climate change. <laughs> yeah, this is this is sad, sad but true. We we now uh, John lives on. Uh, you're on the the island, right, John? Uh, no, I'm in Vancouver, Central okay. Vancouver. Uh, and it has been like beautiful here, but now we we when it's a warm, dry spring, we get very concerned because of the forest fires. And uh, so we're anticipating that it could be a, a kind of another weird summer. Last summer was was brutal, as most people know. Um, but, uh, but let's see. Um, I think we'll probably get started in just a moment if that's okay. Yeah, we got people coming in and, and there'll, there'll be more coming in. So um, if everybody's okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get us going. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody, and, and probably as most of you know, I'm Douglas McLeod. I'm the chair of the Center for Architecture at Athabasca University. Um, Athabasca University, in case you don't know, it is a, um, it's a, not just an online university, but it's an open university as well. And we have staff and students in 84 different countries around the world. So many of us live on the traditional lands of indigenous people. I, I myself live on the unceded territory of the Silix Nation, but we honor the ancestry, heritage, and gifts of all of these people and nations. And I would encourage you, if you'd like, to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. But we also think that it's time to start doing more. And so we support the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we hope that we can act as allies and supporters in realizing recommendations such as the call to action number seven, which is, we call upon the federal government to develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational and employment gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. So this is particularly relevant to this lecture series, which is focused on the future of architectural education. For, for a number of years, we have worked with partners around the world on a global studio, and we hope in the near future to renew this project. And of course, we would invite everybody who's on the call today to be part of that. What it did, though, and this is why it was important, it demonstrated the breadth and the depth of architectural programs and approaches around the world. And the most valuable thing about it was that we started to create a, a network of people uh, and we, who came together to collaborate and to share their work. And so we're starting to build a new kind of network with, with this lecture series and just touching base with some of the people who, who have been speaking or will be speaking has been a really energizing experience for me. Um, so today, Stacey Woolsey is going to speak, but um, on, well, depending on where you were, uh, on April the 2nd, if you're in North America, and on April the 3rd, if you're in Australia, Francesco Mancini, who's the deputy head of School of Design and the Built Environment at Curtin University in Perth, Australia, um, it will be speaking. And that's a totally online and very, very innovative school in Australia. I'm going to be speaking uh, about Athabasca University and our experiences using technologies such as AI and simulation on April the 9th. And then we're going to close out the series with uh, Philip Bernstein, who is the Associate Dean at Yale, who's going to be talking about AI and the education of the architect on April 23rd. So we'll put links into the chat for the in our Instagram account where you can find out about each lecture and um, register for them as well. But today I'm delighted to have uh, Stacey Woolsey with us. She's the founder of the alternative learning system, Make Your Own Masters or MYON. 
It began in 2018 when she faced financial barriers that prevented her from accessing institutional education in the United Kingdom. So over an 18 month period, she independently uh, sought out creative briefs and support uh, live and support live from the industry. And she then showcased her learning with a, a solo exhibition at Somerset House where the scale of the issue soon became apparent. Taking her learnings, she expanded the project to assist others in similar situations. And so the MYOM is currently guiding its second multidisciplinary collective through this experimental system, aiming to address the lack of access to education and establish new pathways into the industry through lifelong learning and collective support system. Um, and so in addition to leading this, this collective, I don't actually know how she can do all this. She's collaborated with prominent brands such as BBC, WWF, and Somerset House. She has held visiting lecture positions at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels at institutions including the UAL, the AA, and Kingston University. And presently, she has undertaken a role as the creative research and ideation manager at Selfridges and Company. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stacy. Welcome, Stacy. Hi, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for asking me to come today. Um, I'll share with you a bit of a presentation. Um, if I Shall I jump straight into that, Douglas? Is that the best oh, way please, to get please. going? Great. Um, I'll quickly share my screen. Um, I think maybe the best thing to kind of disclose is that you thought you were coming here for a bit of a lecture, but I think it's actually going to turn into a, a bit of a story time. Um, because I think the reason Make Your Own Masters exists is like Douglas mentioned, it was very much kind of a lived experience and it was a solution to a problem that I found myself in. And it's kind of um, it's kind of grown and grown and grown over the years into something more and more, but it is all through this sort of real kind of lived and kind of learning by doing experience. Um, so I'm just gonna really briefly introduce you to Make Your Own Masters. What it is is kind of an overarching kind of idea and theory um, as of now, and then kind of take you back a little bit into kind of how it started. Um, that very much is story time. And then the response that that kind of created, how the experiment kind of furthered, the methodology that I started to kind of pull and extract from that experiment, the impact it's had so far, and then kind of bring you right up to kind of the present day, so where we are now, and hopes, plans, dreams and ambitions for the future. Um, it's all still very chaotic and very messy. So uh, I'm guessing everybody will have a lot of questions and I'll have probably missed out a lot of details. So yeah, we'll I'll answer those all at the end. Um, so just to get started, uh, Make Your Own Masters is, yeah, like I say, it's quite complicated, but the creative industry and education seem to have a huge problem. The barriers to entry are too high, forcing out and denying access to vital talent. Mayum is a creative learning movement looking to tackle the drop off between university and industry for those from less advantaged backgrounds. The project builds a multidisciplinary, multi background collective each year, bringing people together with the common goal to build a year of self directed learning and break down the barriers many face in pursuit of a creative career. And so, how all of this sort of began. Um, I graduated university in 2016. Um, I did a graphic design degree. And um, without turning this into kind of like, this is my life, uh, I was the first person, I'm from a town in the north of England called Doncaster. And I'm, um, as far as, it's a great place if you find yourself there. Um, but opportunities aren't kind of readily available. Um, and it's a it's a working class town and everyone that's kind of I'd never known anybody go to a university. I was the first in my family um, and it was a really, really big deal. And what I kind of learned as I was there was I took every single every single learning I could get. I kind of drunk it all in. And I really thought that like this this degree and this ticket was my kind of one way train to sort of success and a job and and that I was kind of following these dreams and this was going to be the the gateway for me um and and a lot of that's true for a lot of people but I think the reality and, and this is specific to kind of the UK um the reality is that education isn't necessarily that sort of barrier into uh, that sort of ticket into 
success and a job and and the people that seem to not have great success are the ones that do come from a slightly more disadvantaged backgrounds because the reality of it is is that you're thrown out into an industry with no connections with no way of navigating that industry um i'd never known anyone like i said with a degree never mind a creative job so there were all these sort of like unwritten and these gray barriers that weren't necessarily to do with level of education or finance but they were the navigation of this was incredibly difficult um, and incredibly unspoken about and so you're kind of put into this industry where your internships is the gateway um, and so I was doing all these internships but the reality of that for someone that's also trying to financially support themselves is you're working for either free or very little you're trying to kind of find a flat and rent a flat, but you're having to kind of pick up bar jobs around that. But these internships only last for three months. Um, and how can you kind of rent somewhere if you don't have a, a real job to put behind it and your parents can't be the guarantor? So there's all these sort of like problems that really start to bubble that actually, if this isn't your world, it becomes a lot harder to navigate and the, the waters are a lot muddier. And those opportunities are much fewer and far between. And so where that sort of left me was I'd done this for a year and a half, these internships and these small jobs, and I just couldn't feel like I was getting anywhere. Um, and so I had two options. I was either going to go back home and forget I even tried or go back to university. And I had this idea that if I went back and got a master's degree, then I'd be even more employable because I think that's the narrative most people are taught through school is that education is the thing that gets you the job. And if I was really, really educated, then I'd be really, really employable. And that's how um, I'd managed to break through and break in. So that's when I decided to start looking at MAs in the UK. And currently, as it stands, um, an art and design master's course in the UK costs £52,000 to study and live in London. Um, so this is a bit of an updated stat. When I was do looking for myself, I actually was emailed by one of the universities and they recommended that I saved £40,000 to be able to pay the fees up front and to sort of be able to sustain myself living in the city. Um, and that kind of was a number that it's the, the financing systems aren't, um, aren't like they are for undergraduate level. This is very much if you don't have the money, you don't attend. Um, and I really believed that I'd find a loophole and that there would be a way in and that I could just kind of add to this imaginary debt that I'd built myself already and I wouldn't have to worry about this problem for years but the reality was that it was very much you're not coming and um and this is just not for you and so I was really ready to pack my bags and and kind of leave um oh, before I carry on on my story but the, and the sort of the more I've looked into this as a problem it turns out that actually only 10% of the UK population can afford a master's degree. And these sort of barriers and barriers build up and it's creating this almost bottleneck of talent where actually it turns out that 99.1% of jobs in the creative industry are filled, are filled by the more, more advantaged groups. And so I decided this had irritated me a little bit and I, um, rather than kind of let it win, I kind of had this idea that if I called myself a designer and what I wanted to do and learn was how to design and solve problems, I'd actually found myself a real uh, a real world problem. And that maybe if I can't afford to buy an education, then why don't I make my own? And it was just a really simple idea. And I, I think I was riding my bike somewhere. Um, I'd finished a really late shift in a pub and, and I'd had this idea and I thought that's stupid. And then the next morning I woke up and was like, no, maybe maybe there is something in it. Um, and so I drafted this email that sort of explained my problem. It kind of laid out that I wanted to build, I wanted an education, but I couldn't afford it. So rather than pay the fees, what if I just spent a year kind of learning on my own um, and building that, that curriculum and that sort of space for myself? And I researched kind of artists and designers whose works, I, I really loved their work and I really loved what they were doing. And I could listen, I'd listen to all their talks online and they were such inspiring people. And I just sent them this email on an absolute whim thinking they'll never reply to me. Um, but if they don't reply, then I've not lost anything anyway. Um, so I sent this email out and probably went to the pub with my friends and didn't think much more of it. And within a week, all of them got back to me and was like, we understand where you're at, like we appreciate this is a problem. 
um, what do you want from us? How can we help? Um, and that was kind of the first point where this sort of whole project started to get under underway. I went and met, so these four artists and designers are Daisy Ginsburg, she's a designer. Um, she works within the realms of kind of speculative bio, uh, design and um, synthetic biology. Sital Solanke is a, a materials researcher. Room Y was an experimental lab set up within John Lewis, which is like a department store uh, within the UK. And Thomas Thwaites was a, a another speculative artist. Um, this image is from a, a project he did where he turned himself into a goat for a month to see what living like a goat would be. And I didn't really understand how any of these people had jobs or how it worked, but they seemed to be making it work for themselves. So I just kind of wanted to learn from them. Um, so they all agreed and they all set me a brief. And I realized that actually just doing these projects over a year and a half was gonna be quite a lonely um, and quite difficult kind of journey. And so I decided that I also couldn't rely on those four people for all of my learning. So I took the same tactic and started right into different sort of practitioners that had a real variety of skill sets and started to ask them kind of, would they mentor me or guide me or just go for a coffee with me if ever I needed to learn how to code or sculpt or just sort of generally just have a catch up or moan to someone. And again, the response was really positive. Um, people were willing to help and willing to give me a bit of time. We never set sort of um, restraints or like parameters around this. It was just like, if you can, if we can go for a coffee, that would be great. And I just kind of darted around London, meeting people for coffees or just jumping on calls with them. It wasn't this big sort of structure or commitment. It was much more of a kind of human way of building kind of professional relationships. And then the final sort of tier of this was I realized that I needed people that I could relate to or people that were learning at the same time as I was learning. Um, and so I started to build a network of peers. Um, and I, I'm sure most people at your institution and institutions all over the world agree that it's the peers are the people that kind of make your university experience the most valuable. And so I started approaching people that I was working with in pubs or that I did go to university with already or people that were on the other side of the world, that anyone that was kind of in this creative world, I just used this kind of vehicle of like, I just want to learn, will you be on board with me to kind of build up this kind of network and blanket of support around myself. And by the end, um, this feels kind of like quite cold, putting everybody into numbers and, and talking about what is essentially networking in such a way, but by the end, I'd managed to kind of get more than a hundred people to support me and back me and offer me time or um, knowledge in, in any way. Um, and all of a sudden this sort of, what was an email and an idea started to build into a project and a community and a, it had a time scale attached to it. And, and it really started to feel like it was, it was forming into something. Um, and so the final thing that made this sort of very DIY, very kind of real, but not real year of learning. Um, the final missing piece for me felt like I needed somewhere to go. I needed somewhere to do this. It wasn't going to be, it felt like I was preparing myself for quite a lonely year if this was just going to happen in my bedroom. Um, and so I found a co-working space that had different kind of making facilities and um, workshops that was in the centre of London. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with it, but Somerset House is a, um, a really old stately home in the middle of London, but it's a bit of a cultural centre now. Um, and, in, and in the basement, there is a company called Makerversity, and they have lots of different kind of making workshops. And it's a start-up sort of co-working space for makers. And I again told them the same story. Um, and they gave me a space for a, a year and a half and a year and a half sort of thing um, just to kind of make this project come to life in. And so I felt like at this point that I had everything. Um, and it was a long year, um, a very long 18 months. And there were a lot of ups and a lot of downs. But I kind of came out the end of it with these four projects that all spoke to this, uh, the different briefs that I was set. And they were really varied and they were really kind of questioning different things, themes, and they were about 
research and they were about storytelling and they were about materials, but they were about futures. And I kind of came out the end of it and I was like, this is great. And I've met a lot of great people and I've learned a lot of skills, but what on earth do all these projects mean together? Um, and so the end of Make Your Own Masters was very much a point of like, okay, great, I've done this, but but what is it? And what have I learned from it? And what has kind of come out of this? And so I decided to hold a show at Somerset House. Um, the whole year was just a lot of, I don't know how to phrase it in a better way, but it felt like I was just begging and borrowing and kind of like hustling and um, just asking for favours or getting my way into places that I, I don't know how I really got into. But Somerset House is a really prestigious art space. And I got a little room in there for free and held this little exhibition. Um, and it kind of felt like all of a sudden, without me even noticing it, I'd kind of built something and something had kind of happened. And so many people came and it really all of a sudden just sort of fell into place that actually um, the most important thing that I'd learned along this entire sort of programme wasn't necessarily how to sculpt or, or all of those things. It was very much that I learned how learning can happen. Um, and an important thing to note that, again, everything within this is very kind of DIY and very scrappy and therefore where does validation come into this conversation? And, and and I had a lot of conversations around validation. Who validates this? Um, is it a real master's? And the answer is no, it's not a real master's. Um, and I don't really ever want it to be. My kind of thinking was that this has all been kind of without an institution. And, and what does validation really mean in kind of a much more contemporary context how do we validate what's working and especially within creative subjects who tells us what's good or not um this isn't sort of a tick box exercise it's not brain surgery so how can i kind of prove that my work's good uh, and surely the the kind of real proof is what my peers think or what the people that sent me the brief think or eventually what a future employer might think and so I opened the show up for kind of mass validation, um, which I thought at the time was going to be kind of like a, this will get me out of the sort of validation um, kind of exercise. And then I realized that actually, I think I'd rather have five experts in a room than 150 people with a lot of opinions um, come and scrutinize everything I'd done. But I did definitely open myself up for this. Um, and all these people filled out these validation forms across the week. Um, and so I think what the, the point for me where this all really started to make sense um, was when I decided to kind of name my masters. Um, this is a photo at the one woman graduation. This all seems very arrogant when you kind of put it in a in one big story. Um, and I didn't make that cap and gown for myself. My friends made that. I didn't take it that far. Um, but. I off like I mentioned, I didn't have a real master's, but in a weird way, I'd taken this year of learning that nobody in the world had taken, and I'd learned things in an order and in a structure and in a sort of an accumulation of um, topics that were completely unique. And in that sense, surely I had become a master of something. So this is my sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink way of getting out of the "Are you a master?" because I decided to name. My, uh, my discipline out of this anthropological future design. Um, all my projects were speculative and they were around designing for this future world, but they were from a very sort of human um, and problem solving standpoint. And does that in an indirect way make me the master of anthropological future design if I'm the only person with that title? Um, and that's all I really thought was going to happen from this. I thought I'd have a portfolio and I thought I'd have some nice pictures of some work that I actually wanted to go out and talk about. And eventually I could I could actually get a job now. And I was also very tired. I kind of I went on a holiday and I hid, hid under a rock for a month because I was like, I'm not doing that again. That was that was a lot of work. Um, but what kind of became very apparent very quick is that the response to this was way bigger than one person in a, in a way. It wasn't 
necessarily about me and my learning anymore. I think people took the sort of the project and and I almost amplified it and made me really realize that obviously this problem was bigger than me and obviously there's going to be a lot more people in that situation. Um, and so the project started to kind of get a lot of press and a lot of kind of exterior opinion on this. And I really thought that nobody would care and that if anything, people might be quite angry because I don't know, I was going against institutions or something um, or that it was just a little bit like of a, a non-start. But actually the, the response was kind of overwhelmingly positive. And a lot of people agreed that there, there was a problem and that maybe what does it mean if solutions like this are starting to emerge? Um, and then it sort of became the much more personal and the direct responses where all of my inboxes were kind of filling up with people telling me that they were in the same and they'd felt the same and they don't know what to do and they were stuck. And I think that's when I really started to kind of feel that that there, not that there was a responsibility on my shoulders, but that I I could do something with this and that this was something that I cared about an unbelievable amount. Um, and actually, like, where, where do I where do I stand now? What does this sort of mean? And so I took a bit of a moment to kind of reflect on it. And um, and I didn't walk out of it straight into a job. But what I did realize is that actually, what what did I gain? Um, and within a year, which I think is not the longest of time, is that I'd got paid work. So a lot of that within the fields I wanted, it, it, most of it came from the people that sent me briefs um, or different creative opportunities that kind of came along as I kind of started to really branch out and, and uh, talk to people along the sort of along the way. I had that network of 100 people that weren't kind of like people that felt like I'd met them at a exhibition and we were all talking about our work it felt like a network of people that would really support me um and I would do the same in return for them I had a practice that I could talk about and I could kind of wrap language around it that wasn't just kind of like I'm a graphic designer or I'm an illustrator it was kind of like I could really talk to the work I did and why I did it and I had a portfolio that was probably going to stand out for most people's because it, it was a little bit all over the place um I'd forged all these new opportunities. I'd won some funding from the BBC. Um, I managed to work with different brands. Um, I don't know how they even kind of found out about it, but it must have been through this kind of active pushing. I learned a lot of new skills, a lot I'll never use again, but um, a lot of kind of just really starting to kind of learn on the fly. And I think the main thing that came out of it was confidence. I think when you start as sit and tell this project back it sounds like I must have had all this confidence in the world and I just kind of wanted to run out there and and make the most of it but actually this was very much not that I think I kind of hid behind learning because I didn't dare put myself out there and I didn't dare um kind of put myself forward for things whereas by kind of learning and kind of building this sort of um support system and this comfort blanket around it I could do that now and I felt like I had a lot more to say and a lot more to show for myself. Um, and like I mentioned before, I think the most important thing that I learned along the whole way was really was kind of how to learn and all those tiny little details that if I'd have sat and tried to design this program because I thought it was a good idea, I would never have got to. But by really living it, there was so much information that um, has become absolutely vital. And so in 2000, and this is a test, I think it was the end of 2019, um, a good six months after I'd finished my Make Your Own Masters, I decided that I was going to do it again. Um, I was going to kind of roll this out and, and see how much I can kind of blow this out and push and push the project further. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the feedback I kind of got from people was that um, without again, I sound so arrogant sometimes when I tell this story, but um, it was me that made this project work and I was the one driving it and I was the one pushing it. But I really believed that that wasn't the case. I really knew that like the, the learning in this way could help and could support a lot of people. And so I opened applications in 2020 with 
nothing. I don't know really. There wasn't a lot of logical foresight that went into a lot of this. It was just doing and then panicking afterwards. Um, but I opened the applications um, and decided to kind of find 10 people that were kind of, I don't know if they were brave or stupid enough to kind of join me on um, seeing how far this could go. And I found my first cohort of my own learners. Uh, they were a huge range of ages, disciplines, backgrounds, uh, skill sets. They were such a kind of mixed cohort. And I was like, great, this is really going to test it. Let's see what it can do. We had jewellery makers, digital artists, uh, ceramicists, fine artists, researchers. Um, and I was just so intrigued to see where this experiment goes and and also kind of honestly I had no idea how I was going to kind of pull everybody through it and make it work and so I designed a bit of a program that almost became like this skeleton structure um I would I the word teach is strong but uh, um I would kind of teach how you build how you make your own masters and provide them with a structure and a community and sort of the kind of try and give them all the conditions they need to learn within, but they were the ones going out and finding that learning, finding those briefs, finding those mentors still. So really trying to strike a balance between what the, the kind of the, the magic that was really putting yourself out there on your own, but also doing it with an environment that you were much more supported and, and I could really sort of guide them through it. Um, and so to do that, I started approaching different companies and businesses and spaces across London with this idea of having a learner in residence. Um, I asked them if they would donate a desk one to two days a week to one of the learners that would almost become this sort of like inspiration hot desker and that they could go and learn within their company, not for them, it's not an internship, it's not sort of any sort of, there was no transaction. They were just using their space and hopefully the people around them as um, as that kind of um, to learn from, but they were very much doing their own work uh, within there. Um, and so all of that was set up, they all had a space and then obviously COVID hit. So this whole system had to move online, like a lot of learning um but what was kind of surprising is that in a lot of ways it almost worked better we were so much better connected and um we could kind of we did have to have to kind of regroup as a collective but what i never thought would kind of be a, an element of this which was this sort of digital and this really agile network all of a sudden kind of opened up a whole new way of learning and a new way of delivering learning um, and so a really basic methodology behind Make Your Own Masters is this idea that it is about building this collective learning community. Um, it's not about a curriculum as such. It's much more of a support system. And how we sort of run it is that we spend two months sort of building, designing and understanding what each individual wants to get from learning. And then the first phase is a brief again that they've sourced for themselves, but it's much more about exploring. Um, and then we kind of come back to each other in the middle and, and collaborate as a collective. I think there's something really fascinating in this sort of multidisciplinary learning. Um, I kind of, again, went into this really naively thinking that it would just be this sort of really nice little art school bubble. But in reality is that everybody has had so many different experiences that it takes a real kind of lot of real kind of effort to to bring everybody back together, but kind of the rewards of it are are really exciting. Um, and then the last kind of end of Make Your Own Masters is much more around kind of developing, refining, naming your practice, um, really understanding like what is the common thread that has been through every project you've done this year, and and how does that kind of pull you apart from all the other practitioners. And I think what's important to add here is that this whole structure wasn't developed around um, any sort of learning theory or, or kind of conditions for how people learn best, but the whole thing is designed around how you can learn um, and really sustain yourself. This is for 
again, like I said, people that are doing kind of part time jobs, um, people that may have caring commitments or anything. This is about how you kind of bring learning back into your life. And so these work breaks are situated throughout, not as a summer holiday, but so we can really take kind of financial burden out of um, these spaces. And it works on this kind of like really basic structure of every month I lead a session, the guys catch up together, then we invite an external person to come in and talk to us. What's quite nice about that element is that as the learners have kind of gone through the system, they recommend they are actively going out and finding people to talk to us. So when we've had people come in and talk about funding, but then we've also had someone come up and talk about an initiative they started around raising money for charity by designing different chairs and it's just a, all of it is such a complete mashup of ideas the whole time um but it, it does really create an interesting sort of environment and then I have one-to-ones just as almost this kind of like um marking the ground to make sure everybody's kind of I'm the person kind of keeping them accountable to their own deadlines um and just a few of those different sessions uh, just as some examples are kind of about changing mindsets really sort of kind of thinking as a group as to how we make opportunities for ourselves how do you create a really safe critical environment um thinking in stories is a session that always seems to go down really well with everyone um how do you learn to pick up work that can sustain yourself alongside picking up work that really is kind of um what are kind of the, the more creative side of things. Um, and one of the key things is just really learning, like I mentioned, how to bring um, learning back into your life. So this is a really simple structure that we all sort of define for ourselves at the beginning is kind of how much of your time do you want to spend earning, learning and living? And from that, we can start to build out all these really individual sort of structures um, and people's week is entirely their own or, or months they can plan how and when they're going to learn around themselves but we just have these almost anchor points to kind of pull us all back together as a group um, and again just really starting to like dig in and question why people are making the deci decisions they've made what skills do they want or what interest do they have and how can we start to really play within this area of um, really kind of going out and looking for these um opportunities for yourself um and this is a bit of a work in progress but each each group i've kind of got them over the year to really write a manifesto as a collective um and to start to really define as a group what we've kind of set out to do over each year that this has kind of gone by and so just kind of a brief uh tour through a bit of the impact that the projects had so far um so this is the first collective i air quote graduating um back in 2022 or 2021 I can't remember it all blurs into one um again at Somerset House and I think what was really nice is was that this space was starting to become quite prominent we had it a huge space this time um and it was just so nice to start to see the the project sort of grow and evolve and and really almost be taken out of my hands and it, it has so many different kind of people and voices behind it now um, this is just a bit of an overview of that first collective because they're the ones that have kind of been through the system fully. But all 10 learners completed the programme with a 100% retention rate. Um, the programme and individual learners have won seven industry recognised awards. All 10 learners have gone on to higher paid jobs and new opportunities in their field of choice since leaving the programme. Um, we've created 11 new creative disciplines from anthropological future design to digital natures and habitual play. Um, new creative, 40 plus new creative works covering a wide range of topics, all from diverse viewpoints, including collaborations from a variety of different sectors. And 200 network or briefers, mentors and in-kind supporters over the course. And then I think one thing to mention it potentially is the sort of the they're the very kind of tangible impacts that we can kind of talk about. But I think there's something to be really be said for sort of the soft skills that um, I can kind of see people developing. And there really is this sort of like lack of fear now around experimentation and and 
things not having to be perfect and kind of just really learning through doing things. Um, there's such an obvious display of sort of self-drive and self-motivation and independency that just doing this kind of instantly proves. Um, that sort of gaining of social capital for each individual, they kind of, I don't own any of the relationships between the people that have helped them brief or mentor, that's all their own. Um, I'm just kind of this anon anonymous figure with it, but they're really kind of um, pushing themselves out there. And I think I, sometimes it feels like a bit of a cliche, but the kind of resilience to be able to kind of keep the, the kind of motivation and this going when there are a lot of knocks, there's a lot of lack of opportunity, money is so tight. And I'm really when you kind of like pick behind it, there's not much more here than us just trying to kind of better ourselves. Um, I think there's quite a clear display of collaboration, especially when kind of we get to kind of the final shows like these 10 people have come together for not for no, nobody's making them do it, but they've really made something. And then the commitment that it takes to really stick with this, because it is not an easy way of learning. Um, and I think most will agree to it, but I do think that there's a lot that kind of comes out of this. Um, there's a few different case studies of where a few of the learners are now, the, the opportunities they've had and the jobs and positions they've gone on to. Um, I won't go through this, but these are on the website if anybody is interested. Um, and then some kind of real highlights over the past couple of years. So Make Your Own Masters won um, or was nominated for Des uh, Beasley's Designs of the Year, which is um, an exhibition kind of showcasing um, a variety of experts select the best projects that they kind of feel have had impact on the design industry over a year. And Make Your Own Masters was in that. Um, we've had some real big opportunities to kind of share and show the programme um, at a larger scale. This is Selfridges, if anyone's familiar, they've got really famous retail windows and they gave us one to kind of play with. Um, and so just to kind of bring everyone up to where we are now. Um, so in January this year, I opened applications again to take on a second cohort. Um, and I think what's really important is taking the learnings from the last cohort and again, adapting them and learning from them and, and kind of keeping the whole system as relevant as possible. Um, a lot of the first year's cohort helped me sort of tweak and, and really reboot what we were gonna do second time round. And I think what became important within this conversation was that the language of it, um, I really, I really want this to almost, the more and more I do it, the more I want to be able to kind of push myself away from it and it, and it become the learners sort of owned. And so we've, we've moved away from this language of cohort to this language of collective. And, and this world of sort of, this is a learning program to this is a learning system. I don't want it to feel like it's just something out that is kind of delivered and you're in it and then you're out of it at the other end. I kind of want it to feel like this is something people can take and and really start to challenge themselves with. Um, and again, it was a brand new cohort, um, 10 new creatives, completely different disciplines, got fashion writers, weavers, um, fine artists again. It's a real kind of mixed group of really talented people. Um, if anybody, is in and all around London, they've got a work in progress show on at the moment, which has been, I had nothing to do with, and it was such a such a good um, exhibition that they've thrown together. Um, but then it kind of comes down to what's next for this and, and where does it live and, and where does it go? Um, it's been quite a long process and it is such an, a, a weird kind of model that where does it fit? I think what's always felt really important for me is that the barrier to entry for this is so low. But what that does mean is that there's no income, there's no nothing. This is at the minute just a very stressful hobby. Um, and that in itself isn't particularly sustainable. So what I'm kind of where I'm at with it at the minute is continuing the project very much in the spirit of learning from it. Um, I really want... I, I couldn't appreciate that this isn't a master's and, and that this isn't an, an educational institution and people aren't leaving here with a, any sort of certification. But I, what I really want this project to do is to be that sort of stepping stone between um, 
education and an industry. I think that sort of, I keep kind of referring to it as this drop off of kind of those that aren't from as advantaged or privileged groups, the, the drop off rates. So I really want to do something that just keeps people that might not necessarily have as much support just going for a little bit longer. It helps them find a few more opportunities and can really just sort of um, work within that space. I, and I think what's really interesting is I obviously knew my problem and the reason that I couldn't um, access the learning, but that's that finances is one of them. There's so many more different problems um, and barriers that by taking so many different people through it with so many different um, stories that I'm really starting to understand the many problems that this sort of industry and issue is facing. And I'm almost starting to become a kind of encyclopedia of niches to, to really stress test um, how access is kind of gained. And again, I think that this topic around kind of forging disciplines, um, I think there's something so fascinating in this. Again, this was a few examples from the first collective. Um, this idea of sort of really starting to forge new paths and new ways of working um, feels like something to really pursue. And again, kind of challenging learning. Um, how can we have an education? Um, who kind of, who gets to learn, where we learn, what learning looks like. Um, I think that there's something in this project being so kind of open and so sort of a, a story that people can kind of follow along with. Does it start to kind of really crack learning into new and different spaces? Um, this was a talk that um, the first collective just kind of ran on their own, was just kind of, they were really starting to kind of question their environment and the environments of others. Um, and so can we kind of force more spaces and conversations like this? Um, and just some kind of thinking for the future is kind of how do you begin to position this? Where does it fit? Is it, it's not an institutional model, it's not a model kind of sponsored by a brand or sort of corporate funding. It really is this sort of agile system and network of learners. Um, and so there's these three worlds that I'd really love kind of make your masters to sit in the middle of. And that is sort of research and innovation. I think the projects coming from the individuals are so varied and they're from, like I mentioned, such different viewpoints but they're also almost kind of an amalgamation of, of really thinking in a different way. And, and again, that collaboration piece comes into that really strongly. Um, there is such a social driver behind this. I kind of think that that's where my heart personally really lies within this project is the kind of impact that this can have on, at the minute it's a few individual lives, but kind of, I hope it can really kind of prove a bit of a point and, and sort of change a lot of mindsets around education and then to really sort of be questioning and developing this kind of thinking around what the future of learning and what the future of work looks like um, and again the spaces and the places and the people that sort of um, comes from. So a bit of a kind of top line ambition and um, some of this may feel like a bit of a pipe dream but I think these are sort of the 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 strands that I'm sort of kind of trying to work towards with the project is that kind of really trying to challenge the future of creative education. Um, I'd love the project to sort of build into this catalyst that, that kind of inspires and motivates a bit of a kind of almost creative movement um, to really start to explore the future of learning and, and how people can integrate that kind of into a lifelong part of, um, part of who we are. Uh, there's kind of an ambition that to kind of create a global network of multidisciplinary and diverse talent. I don't think there's any reason at the minute I'm keeping it small and I'm keeping it local because again, I'm learning and growing from it each year, but what's to say that this is an, an international cohort of collective learners. Um, and how can in, in the future we start to kind of support this work? Does it become that these, that we build out a set of services, a set of kind of, um, does it become an international innovation think tank agency hybrid? How can I start to sort of like, with the building blocks of what I have now, really start to learn how to kind of sustain this project and make sure that it can kind of keep going in the future? And that's everything.
from me. Um, I'm sorry that was quite a long ramble. Um, but feel free, yeah, to ask any questions. That was that was wonderful, Stacy. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I was making all sorts of note, notes. Um, we will open it up to questions, and we have a, a couple of ways of doing that. You can uh, raise your hand, and you can speak. You can put something into the chat, or I think there's a Q and A function now in uh, in Zoom as well. So any of those will work. But I just wanted to share with you that um, if we were converting fifty two thousand pounds, which is what Stacy was talking about in terms of the cost. That is uh, ninety thousand dollars Canadian, so it's a uh, it's a substantial amount. Um, I'm just monitoring everything. Does I don't see any hands yet? Um, oh, John's got a, a hand up. Go ahead, John, please. I absolutely love this. It, it speaks to things that I, I I've been talking about doing but never doing for for decades. Um, and it, it it it's absolutely lovely. I I wonder. Uh, um, how do you see the scaling working? Because I, I, this is beautiful at the moment where you've got a, a, a close knit network or a network at least that develops in a close knit way and um, a relatively small number of people and everybody is hugely passionate. Um, where, where, where does it go if it gets bigger? Yeah, I think um, there's quite a few different ideas and and. A lot of these ideas are mine, but they're also the kind of collectives that have come since. They have all their own ideas on how we sort of do this. But I think, I think there's quite an organic way where what I was for a collective, the members of that collective set up their own collectives, and we almost start this sort of like catalyst chain event of of collectives. But then, at the same time, is it through digital learning that I can remotely run a collective internationally? Um, I really, what my big ambition for this year that didn't pull off was, was that I really wanted to, this is quite a very British and problem, but I, there's kind of quite a north-south divide in the UK. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm a pretty proud northerner. And I really wanted this year to kind of like run a collective in London and one in the north. Um, I really felt like I could manage the two and that it would be that we'd have these two adjoined collectives working together. But I just didn't quite manage to get the northern one kind of recruited. Um, there wasn't the biggest biggest of uptakes, but I don't. It's it's hard. I didn't really have a network up there to push it hard enough. But I think with more resources that I could have done that. But yeah, the aim is sort of whether it is kind of like the people that have been through the experience then share the experience, or I kind of have to deliver these sessions in a much more remote way. Yeah, I guess it's uh, uh, there's uh, the similar sorts of things happen with um, homeschooling networks where there are there's there's a role possibly for things that pull the collective together. Uh, I, I, I I I'm just gonna I I had an idea a long time ago about uh, uh, MOOFs and uh, massive open online PhDs. And they're, they're thinking of ways in which that might be coordinated and that sort of thing might run. And again, very, very networked, but there is a there is a need for some kind of um, meta level of networking, you know, where the networks network. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a lot. There was a lot of thinking around. It's all coming back to me now. But it was um, it was remote learning with local. What was it? Remote learning with local collectives, or it was much more that the the collective would be together. But the learning would be remote and so was it kind of setting them creative studios in real physical places i think there's so many like interesting ways you can start to push those that thinking and ideas absolutely brilliant stuff love it oh thank you and uh Mindy, as a as a question please go ahead hello everyone <laughs> Thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. My name is Mehdi Zaid. I am a college professor here in Ottawa, in Canada. Uh, what I was going to ask you is, have you registered this idea under a corporation or something? Or do you have some group of support people to basically be your advisors in this journey? Because I think this is this can grow a lot and this can have a nice future for the learners 
and with the use of technology, I'm 100% positive you are going to take this to a place that so many people are around the world, they can benefit from it. Um, thank you very much if you elaborate on this. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, it is set up at the minute as a nonprofit, but I have never earned a penny <laughs> from it. So um, what I've learned so far is that I'm not, I'm not a businesswoman as of yet. Um, I think I, I'm kind of, I've had support that I was in an incubator program and they were incredible. Um, it's a program called MeWe360, if anyone's familiar. And they were kind of in that really sort of seed idea sort of phase. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, I think, as I mentioned, I kind of work full time around the project. So hopefully um, at some point I can really sort of, at the minute, like all my energy goes into running rather than developing. Um, but I'm hoping in the future that I can kind of really knuckle down and sort of get that sort of side of it off the ground as well. Um, but yeah, spend my time uh, at the moment just sort of proving that it kind of, learning from it and proving it, I think is where I'm kind of at. But I yeah, I'd love to kind of get going with that stuff. Thank you very much. It was amazing. Oh, thank you, Mehdi. Um, I'm looking for more questions. I actually have a whole ton of questions. So uh, in the absence of any hands being up or anything, I, I one of the things Stacey did. Kristen you... hands is up. Oh, OK. Kristen, please go ahead. Douglas, if you want to ask your question, I, I can, I can no, please, do that. Please, please. Um, I, I just wanted to first uh, say thank you so much, Stacey. It's uh, very inspiring. I, I'm part of a, a collaborative in uh, South Africa, and um, I'm really intrigued by by this idea. And we also had Neil Pinder's um, talk last week, which I think is has a lot of crossovers to what you're doing. To as far as this this bigger issue of access. Um, I really like the non-transactional element that you talked about because I think that really begins to speak to the power structures and fundament of fundamentally shifting how people can access learning. And in um, so I, I just wondered if you, I, I thought it might be interesting to like get some of us together who are doing this to kind of brainstorm because I've been doing the project 1955 for years now, and I'm in the same situation as you as it's a stressful hobby. And it, it's like how to make it um, economically viable and so, so that it becomes sustainable. And as you say, step you can step away and it keeps going. So yeah, it'd be really interesting to um, maybe get some of the people together who have been, some of whom have been part of this series and um talk about that and i wondered if you know if you have any ideas of like how you um how how you've how you how you think it could become uh sustainable we've never wanted to go the way of you know looking for donations or grants cuz because pretty soon that's all you're doing is fundraising um and so uh, we've ours we've set up as a social enterprise and but it's yeah it's it's it, it because yeah anyway I'll stop there but thank you and uh very much for the talk no thank you that would be great I think we've probably come up against all the same problems and conundrums that yeah the funding is is the age-old problem yeah 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 but that, that would be great yeah, that's because uh, I think among other, one of the other things I've learned is just having a community around you that is doing similar things um, for support, uh, you know, to support each other because it, it does become, uh, yeah, just uh, you feel like you're fighting the system all, a lot. Yeah, 100%. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, the I, I actually am also intrigued by the idea of what you call a, a global network of multidisciplinary talent or the international uh, innovation think tank. And we've been um, starting to, as Kristen says, starting to reach out and, and collaborate with some very uh, interesting groups around the world. Um, 
Kristen and uh, another faculty member, Veronica Madonna, uh, organized a, um, a student um, work study program in Lesotho in November. And it was uh, with, with a group called uh, RISE, which stands for Relationships Inspiring Social Enterprise. And it was a very, it was an extraordinary experience for everybody. And uh, so there are these little pockets of people doing fascinating mm -hmm. things all around the globe. If we could figure out a, a way to connect them all, I think we could actually do what you suggested. But I'd like to ask the question, you, in, you spoke about financing, um, but you also spoke about there being many more barriers. And I wondered if you could elaborate. Yeah, I think, um, again, I think it is, I, I mean, I assume it's not specific to a UK market, but I think there is a bit of an issue around kind of age barriers within education um, and people kind of relearning um, what Make Your Own Masters felt like it did. And, and there's been, a, there has been quite a wide age difference on this. And I'm sure you guys, um, with how you teach, found that these ways of learning can kind of reintegrate back into somebody's life. Whereas at the minute learning is set up as, it's, as if it's this phase we go through in life. We spend these kind of periods of our and generations of learning and then it's not learning. But I'm really interested in how this starts to kind of blur. Um, there are other issues around kind of people being carers, so time and being really time poor um, and not being able to kind of commit in those ways travel um one of the girls at the minute has a chronic illness that is kind of really kind of it's the kind of physical barriers to what a normal education and being in a really physical location kind of would um exclude her from um kind of yeah social barriers that the kind of i think you name it i think education can kind of put up a few different ones um there's a lot to kind of chip away at It, it is um, no matter how you you cut it. Yes, we Canada has a some interesting, unique problems. There's sort of the the tyranny of distance. It's almost, of course, as far from Vancouver to Toronto as it is from Toronto to London. So, um, and and you know, crossing the country. But there's also the the tyranny of time. I would say as well. Um, how do you find time to do these things in 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 particular? Um, but if if I could ask as well. Um, you, you um, mentioned, and this this is a little bit self-serving for Athabasca University, which is totally online. But you mentioned that when COVID hit, you put the program online, and in some cases, it was um, it actually worked better. You said, could you could you talk more about that? I think um, this, this is sorry, quite a make your master's direct solution, but the the way I kind of planned it was that I would have 10 learners in 10 separate locations. So they would be running quite an individualistic program. Um, but what this forced us to do was kind of be at each other's, um, be much more kind of readily available to kind of meet together as a group. Um, and it also gave them very few excuses not to do so. So it kind of, we could really kind of get there was so much more, I think, talking and, and time spent together than what I would have been able to kind of orchestrate if if it would have stayed in those sort of physical spaces. And then it sort of got me personally thinking about, well, actually, if this doesn't need to be, I think typical institutions are that that education is very much locked within like a physical space. Whereas like if, if you're starting to chip away at all these different ways of doing things, then I'd not really put my head in a space of like, what if this was digital or what if this was online? And it just felt like it opened up a whole new world of kind of like opportunities and ways to think about it as a sort of project program initiative, um, which I'm sure you guys are kind of like testing in real time. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting. There's a, uh, we, we're now of the opinion that it it's not, classroom education versus online education, it's not better or worse, it's different. And mm -hmm. uh, we need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of both modalities in order to really make them work properly. So, uh, but we we found particularly in our design studios that there's all sorts of things that we can do uh, that we can't do in a classroom. So that, that kind of makes it kind of interesting. I'm just scanning for 
more questions or does anybody want to throw up their hand? Because I've got a couple more to tell you the truth, but uh, I'm just looking. I don't want to monopolize, but um, I wonder, you talked about thinking in stories and I wondered if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, I think that was one of the learnings that one of my briefers set out for me was this idea of a kind of thinking in stories and how you communicate. And I think that's one thing that I've tried to integrate along the way is that that was a real moment of learning that stuck with me and that I passed on. And I kind of tried to collect those same insights from the set, the first cohort of like, what was it that somebody said that really sort of changed things? Um, and so thinking in learnings, I kind of built out uh, in story, sorry, built out into kind of a whole session, much more around, I think, again, I think this has been a multidisciplinary sort of learning is that the way different creative disciplines communicate about their work, the way they think, the way they research, the way they put projects together is completely different. And so how do they start to kind of use this structure of telling a story to kind of really start to engage and communicate and collaborate with each other? Um, and it's proven to be a pretty valuable sort of vehicle in, in getting to people not only not only to talk about their projects specifically, but then when we go on to sort of the defining your discipline, it's kind of pulling those stories out of people. Why did you want to do that? What well, what was the big reason? Like, what was the moment? Like, where did it take? Like, it's it feels like it's a real kind of an, a, a way of thinking that really sort of brings people's works and ideas to life. Excellent. Yes, it, there was a um, uh, many, many years ago, back in the 70s, Ray Lipshay, who was at the at Berkeley, he he, um, he was promoting the idea of using narrative as a means of architecture students designing spaces, really saying, OK, if, imagine that there's somebody in the space and they're going to do this, this and this. Um, and it was really compelling kind of approach to uh, designing a space in terms of a narrative. Um, but I, uh, there is a comment in, in the, oh, uh, Kristen's got her hand up and, and then we'll go to some comments. I, I was just curious to ask, I see there's a comment about um, in, the, in the chat about accrediting the program. And I wondered if that is, if that's the direction you'd like it to go, or do you, if you see it as more of like a parallel way, because accrediting it in a sense puts it into the system that created the problem that you face to start with. And um, if rather what you have in mind is like, it's something that lives in parallel, that maybe is a more, um, a more nimble way to address a lot of the issues that this future is facing, whether it's climate change, um, or the economic uncertainty, or that I think a lot of people, and particularly young people, are feeling like, like they're facing, and that maybe this is a, it, a an alternative as opposed to it becoming part of the existing system. And I just wondered what you what your thoughts were on its future. <clears throat> yeah, I think this was a conversation that came up a, a lot when I I first did my version. Um, and I, and I spoke to a, quite a few different creative universities about, and, and a lot of them were actually in Europe, not actually in the UK, about them validating it for me. And, I, and I've kind of, I've, I've gone through the conversations and and I kind of got to a point with it where I was like, I just don't know if it makes sense. I'm kind of telling everyone to go out and make your own masters and and kind of really working on this sort of mindset of just sort of making things happen for yourself. But then at the end of it, they have to come back and, and I have to tell them whether they've done it right or wrong. And so it felt like in a way it started to undermine the whole point of it. And as much as now I'm in this weird like irony of it being make your own masters, but it's not a masters. And, and there's all these kind of odd juxtapositions, but it just felt like that was one where it just doesn't feel like it, it sits right to, it feels like it takes away that sort of self-drive if there is sort of a um, this sort of point of, kind of validation at the end and and I just really sort of believe like again in that sort of ways of uh, future of work and the future of learning that it's much more kind of a skills but if you can prove that you've done it is that sort of enough or or how much value do they, does that sort of certification have I, I don't have all the answers I think um, I'm just sort of trying to make the best judgments of the sort of the the situations that 
I'm in, um, and again, I never want to speak for the whole of education, but at the moment it feels like it, it, it is working and it's it's really is starting to fill that gap between learning and, and professional careers. And not one of the learners so far has, has come up against sort of an issue with that. But people, I think, need people who need that accreditation, I can't help, but the people that don't, and it, it's, it's sort of a, it's a gray area, but I, I'm really, but I think there's a lot of problems with sort of getting this project off the ground. And for me, that one isn't as, as kind of important. I kind of like that it, it becomes this sort of agile, self-driven alternative. Does that answer that? I'm not sure if that answers that question. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel like I agree with you because, um, it, it kind of sets people up for self-starting their their own careers as well, because I feel like that's something that's also really changing and that people, we had a talk a couple of weeks ago and there was a statistic that 85% um, of the jobs in, 19, in 2035 haven't been thought of yet. And um, so I feel like it, it's a really interesting way that sets young people and people of all ages up to like um, start their own things instead of assuming that they'll go out and get a career in somebody else's company or whatever. So I think yeah. it's, a, I think, yeah, I, I kind of love the idea that it doesn't need that validation from, from the institutional system. It feels like it start, it would, it would really start to limit what would come out of it. And, and like I said, I'm not, I'm no expert in, they're all experts in what they're doing compared to me. I just kind of like keep the, the, us all together and make sure we chat now and again. But like, I'd have I just have no authority to to kind of enforce any of that. So it just the more the more the project's gone on, the more it doesn't feel like it would ever sort of fit within the system. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. And John's got his hand up. Yeah, I really to. Uh, reinforce that as much as I can, because uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, the 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 way in which certificates drive education is is entirely the problem with education. I mean, if we if we could decouple those things, then people could get on with learning and do these ex wonderful things that you're doing. Uh, I do wonder, though. I mean, uh, thinking about decoupling. I mean, one of the I, I've been trying to look into ways of doing this um, just because you can't provide certification for things. I guess people are developing portfolios that they've, they've got a, a whole range of things that artifacts that are being produced as a result of doing this. Um, and so there's a, there, there's a case for lobbying people like us um, who do provide certification uh, to, to be able to recognize what people have done but yeah, I mean, it destroys a collective. It destroys a network if you introduce things like that. And I, and I have theory behind this. So if you if you need justification for it, I can oh, I can I, I I can offer this. It's it, it's definitely a very bad idea. But there is a case I think you know rather like uh, you know you can go to anybody to learn how to drive, but you you can you go somewhere else to get licensed. Um, and that might be something that would be an opportunity for us at Athabasca. We have a thing called a, a challenge process, it, which actually was developed by the University of London in somewhere in the middle of the 19th century. Um, but it's uh, where uh, it's, students don't have to do the learning with us. They can just take an assessment. Um, and, and also, I mean, there's in um, in the UK, there's the, what do they call it here? We call it PLAR, and I used to only know the UK version many, many years ago, uh, but the accreditation of prior experience and learning, APEL, um, it, it's, it, it's the sort of thing where, because all of assessment, all of the, the credentialing assessment is, is entirely to do with trust and peer review. It, it, it's that, you know, we trust the universities to have hired people because they're peer reviewed to do it. And effectively, you're kind of doing the same. I mean, you're just, but maybe the network could extend to, to, to people like us who could and uh, add that for people that want it but keep it separate keep it absolutely separate I, I love that that's part there's of why it's 
yeah, there's something quite nice that if an individual wants to pursue it, then you could help that one person get accredited, but not everybody else. If, if it is important in their journey, if they want to go on and do, I don't know, a PhD or something, but that almost becomes part of what they have to build into their program is figuring out how to get it officially recognized. Yeah, and, and it's part of a thing that's a, and I, 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 I'm vaguely familiar with architect programs because my, my wife's done them, but um, I, I can, certainly I can think more in the art where a significant amount of the learning that goes on is about how to get how to get work. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, similarly, part of that is how to get accreditation if you want it. I guess you know that's something which the network itself, the learning network, can can do without you having to put any structure on it yeah yeah that's really interesting lovely <laughs> thank you john um i'm just looking for hands or questions i i did want to ask uh, stacy you talked about the maker university in in summer somerset house uh could you describe that in more detail yeah it's um it's great i can't like say enough how what much of a great place it is but um Within the Somerset House is a huge, huge sort of kind of old building on the on the River Thames, really central. Um, it's just off the Strand, and um, Somerset House they were given a space maybe about ten years ago, um, and it was yeah within the basement, quite a rundown part of the building. But they put a wood workshop in there, three D printers, textiles. Um, eventually, after so many years, built a bit of a bar down there. Um, and they've been so supportive of me since sort of day one. They found out what I would, was doing um, and kind of just said, uh, they kind of let me have a membership and just said kind of, you can be a resident as long as you need it. Um, and then from me sort of doing all of my learning there, they've taken on, I think in total, about four or five of the different Make Your Own Masters learners over the past two years. Um, and I think as far as like a physical space goes, they've really sort of supported us. Um, we also have a second space now, which is probably just worth a mention, a project called the Koppel Project that might be interesting. Um, they're a, another um, non-profit initiative that create artist spaces for within buildings that are about to be redeveloped. Um, so the, yeah, they, they're quite a big creative organization as well. Um, so between the Koppel Project and Makerversity, they've been, some really kind of generous supporters in terms of creative spaces for us to meet physically and and um especially for the learners that need more sort of practical facilities wonderful i'm just checking um any other hands questions just, just following up on that one, this also reminds me of the free university movement, which is I, I quite, I think, quite big in the UK. I know back in Brighton, the free university of Brighton was and where people just volunteer their time and come along and, and do university-ish things without the accreditation. And of course, maker spaces also yeah. that was resonating there. And, and the, the, do, do, uh, do, is, are these part of your 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 network? Are these part of the, the, the how it all fits together? Or the could they, um, be? they could be. They're not as of yet, but it's a bit of a free for all. <laughs> I just, any help? Any? Well, we kind of have. We've done really kind of well from just meeting really interesting people that all seem to kind of get the problem so you kind of like you're an hour into a conversation you're already on the same page um i think there's i think there is like we've mentioned quite a lot of really interesting small really sort of grassroots projects all trying to do a similar thing maybe trying to target slightly different people and slightly different sort of areas but there's definitely lots of these pockets of sort of learning happening yeah, I hope that you undermine us. Uh, uh, you know, we need to be undermined, and this is exactly exactly the kind of thing that should do it. It's, it's we're 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 stuck in a thousand year old model that that probably worked for monks in the twelfth century. But <laughs> yeah, this is this it's, is definitely the way of the future. But it's I think it's an interesting meeting point because I, I also like I mentioned for my BA 
was the, one of the most valuable well what yeah the most valuable experiences of of my life and it and it led to so much and so it's it's such an interesting about like it'd be really interesting to see how the two sort of start to grow together in a way yeah and and we if if this it's even bigger than it is and it is big i mean the sorts of things that you're doing are being done in different ways all over the place um and i it traditionally we have embraced and um take you know many good and innovative things uh and i kind of hope that we don't accept that i hope that that if we do that we'll maintain the uh the freshness and the beauty of it i mean this is the what what's what's lovely is is that these are people who are who really want to learn and are not be uh, and are not having that learning diverted or perverted by the the sorts of structures and conventions that that we and universities impose upon them so uh it, hopefully yes we can all learn from one another but uh yes keep keep yourself fresh and, and keep keep away from us i'd say it's a fine um, it's a fine line between being kind of open and then annoyingly stubborn about not changing certain things i think that's yeah. why i've got money essentially excellent excellent well, well, actually, I, I'm going to have to disagree. I, I hope you don't keep away from us, Stacey, because I think that there's um, a lot of things that we could actually do together. I know um, Kristen and others are interested in in keeping the global studio going, and I wish we'd known about your, your work earlier, uh, and, and we could have in, included you in the first iteration of that. So I, I really think there's some opportunities for connecting, basically connecting the dots right around the globe. Um, because there's so much good stuff that's happening that we should be sharing and how we can um, how we can share and collaborate is really I think one of the critical things that we could be doing. Um, oh there is there is a comment here sorry I, I should share it. Um, Juliet has written my personal experience I started a university as a full-time architecture student and then two years later I switched to remote learning due to physical circumstances. I had a list of necessary assessments for different classes in university, which I studied myself for and passed all of them without issues or barriers. I have been told several times um, that architecture cannot be studied remotely. That was before COVID. However, I currently work in the UK as an architect and and far not and for not every full time uh, not sure what, not every full time student works in architecture at all. Um, uh, I totally believe in remote personal learning. So well done, and good luck with the program. The if if um if I had a a nickel for every time that somebody had told me that you can't uh, study architecture online, uh, we would have no problem funding our program whatsoever. It is it is fascinating, though the the whole there's almost this unique form of weird kind of hypocrisy that's happened since COVID where many schools or many instances we see examples where people haven't fully returned to being online or being in person and yet they're still dead set against online even though they've been doing it for a few years and the world didn't come to an end so it is a it's a fascinating uh it's a fascinating thing um but thank you juliet the uh, okay i'm just checking um anybody want to make a final comment before we let stacy go Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. And I'll just remind everybody our next talk is April 2nd or 3rd, depending on where you are, with Dr. Uh, Francesco Mancini from Curtin University. Oh, John John has raised his hand. Sorry, I'll let you. Oh, no, didn't raise his hand. Okay. The, uh, uh, Miss but thank mouse you. Quick. I was trying to I, I, I was trying to react with 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 applause and, and celebration. I, I just... <laughs> Well, I think I think you do deserve applause and celebration here, Stacey. It was it's an excellent initiative, and we're very glad that you were able to share it with us. No, thank you so much. It's been really nice to meet everyone. Um, yeah, and and chat with you all. Thank you for asking me. Well, it was it again. It's it's added a, an entirely new and important dimension to this whole idea of the future of architectural education that we're talking about. 
So it really helps us get a better understanding of what's going on. And there are comments coming in. Um, thank you, Stacy. Very interesting perspective um, and personal initiative. Thanks, intriguing process here. So you're, you're getting lots of accolades. Uh, hands are clapping <laughs> and other things. Thank you. But uh, with that, though, we'll let you go because I know you're probably pretty busy. Um, but thank you, everybody, for attending. And we hope to see you at the next event as well. Great. Take care, everybody. Bye.